Welcome to the third and final part of the RSET training, crop mapping using synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. On Thursday, we learned from Dr. Christoph Ostier and Matej Racic about time series analysis and analysis ready data and introduced the Sentinel Hub statistical API and machine learning capabilities. Today's webinar is focusing on monitoring crop growth through SAR derived crop structural parameters. Our guest trainers are Dr. Heather McNairn, Emily Lindsay, and Shunfang Zhao from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for all three parts of the training. Answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website, with a due date of April 25th. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martin. After participating in this three-part webinar series, attendees will be able to explain how polarimetric parameters are used for crop condition assessment, demonstrate how to perform Sentinel-1 SAR preprocessing to derive quasi-polarimetric parameters, perform a calibration of a SAR-based vegetation index to the NDVI, monitor crop growth with multi-temporal polarimetric SAR or pulsar data from Sentinel-1, examine crop growth using a canopy structure dynamic model and time series of Sentinel-1 imagery, and classify crop type using a time series of radar and optical imagery. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest trainers, Dr. Heather McNairn and Emily Lindsay. Dr. Heather McNairn develops methods, models, and algorithms to monitor the state and condition of soils and crops using data from multispectral, hyperspectral, and synthetic aperture radar satellites. She is currently leading two research projects, an international comparison of synthetic aperture radar-based methods for crop type and crop condition monitoring, as well as quantifying crop productivity from space, a new radar satellite-based metric for measuring crop response. Emily Lindsay is a PhD candidate at Carleton University, as well as a remote sensing specialist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Her current research is focused on improving native grassland and seeded forage mapping efforts in Canada using synthetic aperture radar. Emily lives in Ottawa, Ontario. Heather and Emily, over to you. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this webinar, webinar uh, being delivered by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and we will be discussing monitoring crop growth using SAR-derived structural parameters. Before we begin, I would like to give a brief outline of what we will be covering in this webinar. I will be starting with an introduction. I'd like to cover the rationale for uh, why we're developing a SAR vegetation index or SAR-VI. Next, I'll discuss the Sentinel-1 SAR parameters that we will be deriving from uh, the, the radar data for crop condition monitoring, then discuss how we're calibrating the SAR vegetation index against the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, and finally an introduction to the crop structure dynamics model. Uh, after that, my colleague Emily Lindsay from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada will lead you through a hands-on exercise. She will be demonstrating how to pre-process the Sentinel-1 SAR data, how to derive these quasi-polymetric parameters from the Sentinel-1 single look complex or SLC data, and finally she will demonstrate how to calibrate the SAR-VI to NDVI. There are a number of learning objectives uh, for this uh, webinar. After participating in this training, uh, you will be able to state the benefits of incorporating radar data from optical imagery uh, for crop condition um, assessment, explain how polymetric parameters are used for crop condition assessment, summarize the workflow for creating a SAR vegetation index that can be calibrated against the optical NDVI in order to create a daily time step of assessment of crop condition, 
demonstrate how to perform Sentinel-1 SAR pre-processing to derive these quasi-polymetric parameters, and finally, how to calibrate the SAR vegetation index to NDVI. Before we begin the uh, technical part of the webinar, I wanted to set the context of why this work is so important. There is uncertainty that remains regarding exactly how climate change will impact the agriculture sector. There will be some opportunities and there will be some challenges. And I've just listed a few of those on this slide. <clears throat> In terms of opportunities, uh, we do expect that uh, agriculture will expand in some regions and due to changes in temperature and precipitation we may expect that new crops will be planted in new regions. Certainly as a northern uh, country Canada we are seeing some of these changes in where uh, agriculture production is occurring. There will however be many challenges uh, to a change in climate. We expect an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. This could include, as examples, drought or violent storms. And these extreme weather events are likely to impact yields and even uh, create situations where producers are unable to seed uh, their land. We also expect that there will be a greater prevalence of pests and pathogens. And what that means is that we expect that the range, frequency, and severity of pests and disease infestations are likely to increase. Because of these challenges, it's really critical that we are able to monitor and, and understand what is happening on the agricultural landscape. And that means understanding what has been typical or normal for a specific geography so that producers and the agriculture sector can develop uh, adaptation strategies to the, these uh, changing climatic conditions. Of course, we've been monitoring agriculture from space for uh, many decades. The Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, uh, has been used extensively by the agriculture sector as a proxy of crop condition and productivity. NDVI is the normalized ratio of the red and infrared optical reflectances and has been correlated by many researchers against productivity indicators uh, for agriculture. So for example, we know that NDVI is correlated with leaf area index, chlorophyll at the leaf and canopy level, um, as well as total above ground biomass. Globally, there are many operational systems that have, built, that have been built around um, a time sequence of NDVI I've listed just a few here. There are many examples of these operational systems built on NDVI. Typically, these operations are providing a metric of the current crop condition, and this is really critical. Uh, these operational systems are uh, providing that metric relative to normal conditions. And that normality is very specific for a, a geography, a location, as well as a time in the growing season. So this means, for example, the NDVI for one field in one location is not necessarily um, uh, comparable to the NDVI uh, of another field at another location. And certainly NDVI we know changes through the growing season. Uh, I want to provide a specific example of these operational systems and I'll use the Canadian uh, program um, as this example. So we call this the Canadian Crop Condition Assessment Program, or CCAP. CCAP uh, is delivered by Statistics Canada uh, in order to monitor uh, operationally across the entire agriculture extent of Canada. And our department, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, assists uh, Statistics Canada in delivering this operational system. Uh, CCAP is an incredibly important service for Canada and it's accessed by all levels of government, federal and provincial, for example, marketing agencies, crop insurance companies, researchers, and uh, agricultural producers themselves. CCAP provides reliable, objective, and timely data on um, cropland condition, as well as the condition of pastures and rangelands for the entire agricultural extent of Canada and as well as for the northern portion of the United States. 
but bear in mind this is the Canadian example and that there are many of these operational systems that are operating at national scales and that are being delivered by international organizations as well. Uh, CCAP estimates NDVI by creating um, a seven-day composite of initially AVHRR data from the NOAA satellite and more recently uh, from MODIS data. These image products are created weekly, so we have one NDVI estimate each week. And because of the satellites we're using, uh, these products are delivered at a relatively coarse resolution. Uh, for MODIS, for example, 250 meter spatial resolution. You can see on the right hand side, this is a screen capture of uh, what we, uh, what is available through the CCAP program. And as you can see, CCAP provides uh, map products. This is an example of uh, at a pixel level, but also CCAP provides tabular information um, as well as uh, graphs of NDVI through the growing season. CCAP compares the current condition to the historical normal. Uh, so in the case of CCAP, the historical normal, normal dates back to 1987 for AVHRR and back to 2000 for the MODIS satellite. And in Canada, we run CCAP uh, from, the Juli from Julian week 15, which is approximately the start of the Canadian growing season to Julian week 41. This is a specific example from the CCAP program. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see uh, an image product from CCAP. This is for the week of uh, August 2nd to the 8th from uh, 2021. And keep in mind what I just, what I just mentioned, that NDVI is, um, the NDVI products are provided relative to the normal. Um, so what we can see in the first week of August of 2021, that across the Canadian Prairie region, as well as the Northern United States, that the NDVI uh, for these agricultural lands is uh, much lower than what we would expect historically for NDVI to be over this region. And these lower than normal NDVI values are well correlated with what we know from the statistics from 2021. Uh, so in 2021, we had a significant reduction in the production of canola, which is a very important crop for Canada, and the production of wheat fell by almost 35%. Uh, and this is because of severe drought that occurred in 2021. Uh, due to a lack of rain uh, during periods of the growing season, as well as higher than average uh, temperatures throughout the season. As well, going into the growing season, the soil moisture reserves were much lower than uh, typically we would see in this region, and that created these drought conditions. Uh, you can see a graph uh, from the CCAP program um, on the bottom right. And what we see in 2021 is that um, what's displayed in blue is what is normal, the normal NDVI for this particular region. And we can see in green, this is the NDVI that is uh, recorded for 2021. And what's noticeable is that at the beginning of the growing season for this particular region, uh, that the NDVI for 2021 was on par with what we would uh, expect uh, from the, the normal NDVI, and then we see a significant uh, leveling off of NDVI um, due to these drought conditions. There are a number of limitations for these optical-based crop condition uh, systems. Um, so, for example, I mentioned that we get one NDVI point um, per week. Uh, so these NDVI values can be provided on a pixel level, so a 250 meter level, or on an administrative unit. Uh, the seven day stacks are used to mitigate cloud cover. So we stack up one image from every day over seven days. And the assumption is that uh, hopefully during that seven day period, there'll be at least one day where that pixel will be cloud free. These stacks leverage optical satellites such as AVHR and MODIS, which provide daily data, but the trade-off, of course, is on the spatial resolution. 
So the, the best resolution we can produce is 250 meters um, or larger if we're thinking about AVHRR, for example. And of course, at these resolutions, we're not able to assess crop uh, field level crop condition because a single pixel will contain multiple fields and likely multiple crop types. On the right-hand side, uh, here's another example from the CCAP program. And I've just circled in red, this is a census agriculture region. These monitoring systems can provide, as I mentioned, NDVI at a pixel level or at an administrative level. So an administrative level in Canada is called a census of agriculture region where multiple fields are contained within this statistical region. So we get one NDVI value per region um, and one NDVI value per uh, Julian week. So those are some of the limitations of these optical systems. So of course, this is why we're looking at synthetic aperture radar to determine um, if SAR can provide additional information on crop condition. Uh, there's been a, a significant amount of research done on developing vegetation index from radar. A well-known one, of course, is the uh, Radar Vegetation Index, RVI, that was created by Kim and Ben Zeal. So that's one example. Our department, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, uh, we've been uh, looking at an alternative approach uh, to some of these other um, approaches that you see in the literature. Um, and that is that we are trying to create a SAR VI that will allow us to integrate that SAR information into these existing NDVI operational products. Uh, these systems have been running for decades, so it's really important to bring SAR into that, uh, that operational uh, system. By bringing radar into the existing systems, this is going to promote uptake by the community. I mentioned uh, there are a number of clients that rely on this, uh, this uh, optical-based system. And so it's not an option to uh, ask these communities to throw out an existing operational system and uh, take up a system based only on radar. So we're not looking at replacing the current systems. As well as I've demonstrated, we need to look at crop condition as it relates to historical normal. So we know what's typical for a specific geography and a specific time in the growing season. So for example, when MODIS replaced AVHRR in the CCAP system, there was a calibration done against uh, between those two uh, data sources so that the historical normals could continue to be leveraged. And because of that, CCAP measures normal for a specific week, week in geography using data for the last 35 years. And that's why the objective of this work is to create a SAR vegetation index that can be calibrated against optical NDVI and thus integrated into this existing operation. Of course, we know that optical and radar sensors respond to different target characteristics, but there are some linkages between these two data sources. Visible infrared reflectance responds to plant pigmentation and structure um, at both the leaf and canopy scales. So in terms of leaf structure, we can uh, see a correlation between reflectance and things like leaf area and leaf orientation, especially when we are thinking of satellite scales. Uh, radar sensors uh, respond to, of course, the dielectric or water content in the target, but the, the scattering of microwaves is, is significantly impacted by the geometry of the target as well. Um, and that geometry dictates not only the intensity of the backscatter that's received by the sensor, um, but also the angular scattering characteristics. So for crop canopies, we think about the size of the leaves, the shape of the leaves, how the leaves are oriented uh, towards the microwave signal as well. Um, in terms of a SAR backscatter, uh, this has been correlated as well with crop biophysical parameters that are related to crop structure. So we've seen um, correlations between uh, backscatter and scattering characteristics and things like leaf area and biomass. So you see at the canopy structure, there is a link between what optical and radar sensors are responding to. In this webinar, we are going to be using polarimetric data and there's a very good reason for that. 
This type of data provides a more complete scattering uh, characterization of the radar response. So we are looking at not only the amount of energy uh, scattered back to the satellite a sensor, um, but also gathering information about how the canopy is structuring those scattered waves. A canopy structure is closely related to crop development, so things like phenology and biomass. And because of that link between scattering and scattering characteristics and crop structure, this is why polymetric data is very interesting and useful to detect crop growth as well as biomass accumulation. On the right hand side, this is a, uh, a flow chart of the processes that we are going to talk about in this webinar. Uh, so Emily will certainly go through the pre-processing of the radar data. Um, in this webinar, we will be focus focusing on Sentinel-1 data. A feature selection is an option. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, then we're going to uh, provide an overview of um, developing the calibration between the radar vegetation index and NDVI, how we fit the radar vegetation index to a crop uh, structure dynamics model, and then how you can use that uh, crop structure dynamics model to provide uh, daily estimates of crop condition. Before we get into um, the, the processing of uh, the radar data, I want to go over quickly the differences between fully polymetric or quad pull data and quasi polymetric or pseudo polymetric uh, data. With fully polymetric sensors, uh, these sensors transmit two orthogonal, uh, orthogonally polarized waves, um, typically horizontal and vertical linear, uh, but these could be any two orthogonal uh, waves. And these sensors receive two orthogonal waves on, on return, and again, typically horizontal and vertical. And what's very critical for polarimetry is that these sensors measure phase and that phase is retained during the processing of the SAR signal. These single look complex data can be stored in many different formats. Uh, one format, for example, uh, could be the three by three covariance matrix. And that three by three covariance matrix has nine elements, and that helps us capture the full characteristics, characteristics of the scattering from the target. Examples of quad pull data, uh, we have uh, that mode available on the Canadian Radar Sat 2 satellite, and quad pull modes are also available on the Canadian Radar Sat Constellation mission or RCM. In terms of quasi or pseudo polymetric modes, um, on, uh, in these modes, the sensor is transmitting one polarization only. Uh, it could be, for example, the vertical linear polarization, or it could be a circular polarization, but there's only one polarization transmitted. Two orthogonal uh, polarized waves are uh, measured on return, and again, typically vertical and horizontal. But again, what's important is that the uh, phase uh, is measured and retained during the processing of uh, the signal data. SLC data can also be stored in a covariance matrix, but this time uh, it's stored in a two by two covariance matrix. We have less information. Um, and that two by two covariance matrix has only four elements. So we were capturing some of the scattering characteristics, but not all of the characteristics that we would get from quad pole data. So examples of this mode could be Sentinel-1 dual pole SLC data um, and the, the RCM uh, uh, mission also has uh, a compact polar metric mode. In that mode, RCM is transmitting a circular polarization and re receiving two linear polarizations. Uh, so we have completed this analysis using fully polymetric data from RadarSat2 data, as well as uh, Sentinel-1 SLC data. In this training, we will focus on SLC data, given that this uh, constellation is providing uh, consistent coverages. The Sentinel-1 dual pole uh, SLC data that we're using in this training is VVBH, um, and that data can be stored in a two by two covariance matrix. That matrix is, is displayed in this uh, slide. 
and you can see that there are four elements of that uh, matrix. Uh, in that two by two covariance matrix, um, phase is preserved and each pixel has both a real and imaginary component. So it has a component of intensity as well as a, a component of phase. So using this two by two covariance matrix, we can derive uh, some scattering um, parameters which are similar to fully polymetric parameters, but in some cases not exactly the same. And we will talk about that in just a minute. On this view graph, I've listed some selected polymetric uh, parameters. So you can see a definition of them and as well as their mathematical uh, formulation. Uh, if you look at some of the radar processing uh, software, there may be other polymetric parameters that can be derived from both Sentinel data or fully polymetric data. We've chosen to select uh, these few polymetric parameters because we have been able to, through our research, um, understand that how these parameters are responding to crop canopies. And these parameters have shown a sensitivity to uh, crop type as well as crop growth. So this is why we're focusing on these. Next, I want to step through each of these and talk a little bit about uh, what these parameters mean and how they respond to uh, the crop canopy. I will show a series of examples of Sentinel-1 data uh, from our test study site. This is Carmen Elm Creek, Manitoba in Western Canada. Uh, this will also be the site of the data that Emily will be using in her um, hands-on exercise. In Carmen, Manitoba, there are 20 to 25 different crop types that are present, but the cropland uh, acreage is really dominated by these uh, four crop types, uh, soybeans, wheat, canola, and corn. I provided these uh, photos of these crop types to illustrate that these crops have vastly different crop structures. Certainly the total above ground biomass is different among these different crop types but the structures are also different. So the size of the leaves and how the leaves are oriented um, are, are, are vastly different. And these structures within each crop change significantly as the crops grow. And recall that I mentioned that uh, polymetric scattering is very sensitive to the geometry. And this is why these polymetric parameters are really informative in terms of tra tracking um, how crops are growing. We'll begin with the intensity parameters. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're focusing on Sentinel-1 dual pole data, VVVH. Uh, so in this case, of course, we can derive the backscatter intensity and we can also create a polarization ratio. Um, so this is also termed, uh, we can also calculate the span or the total power. Um, so the total power would be uh, the, that total intensity from uh, four channels if we're considering fully polymetric radar or two channels if we're thinking about quasi-polymetric data. Uh, so for example, if we have quad pole data, uh, span is the total intensity of these four linear polarizations. For quasi-polymetric data, span is the sum of the intensities of VB and VH. So you'll notice right away that we refer to span for both quasi-polymetric and fully polymetric um, sensors, uh, but the information is not the same, even though they're defined the same way. So for example, with Sentinel-1 uh, dual pool, there is no HH intensity that's recorded. So that's missing from span or total uh, intensity. Um, HH is probably the polarization that's least important when we think about monitoring uh, crops, but nevertheless, it's missing from this total power. On the right-hand side, this is a image of a span or total intensity from that study site in Western Canada uh, from the first week of August. So all of these examples I'm going to show um, are from the same study site and the same um, week in the growing season, the same date in the growing season. So we expect a low span or low total power when we have bare soils. Um, that's because we don't have a lot of vegetation to create uh, volume scattering. And then as crops grow, 
uh, the amount of scattering increases because we have a greater contribution from uh, multiple scattering and volume scattering due to that uh, growing canopy. The degree of polarization is a very interesting um, polarimetric parameter. Uh, we'll step back a little bit and think about how uh, a radar sensor um, propagates energy. So when a signal, a microwave signal is propagated by a radar uh, system, that wave, propagated wave, is completely polarized. So that means that the polarization being transmitted is fixed and that um, polarization is known. As that fully polarized um, transmitted wave interacts with a target, think about a crop canopy, um, that wave is going to be scattered by a lot of different elements within that canopy. So those the leaves and the stalks and, and the, the fruit and seeds that have developed, uh, that fully polarimetric wave is going to be scattered in all different directions. And because of that uh, multiple scattering effect, um, that will vary the phase and the polarization of the scattered wave. These multiple scattering events result um, in a scattered wave that is now only partially polarized and partially unpolarized. And that's measured by this parameter degree of polarization. And that ratio uh, between polarized and unpolarized scattering um, varies from one crop type to another. But very importantly, the degree of polarization also changes as crops grow. So as the phenology changes and the conditions in the canopy change as well. In this slide, I'm uh, displaying some uh, photographs from a canola field. And what we can see is early in that, uh, early in the season for canola, we have a lot of soil showing and the canola plant during that leaf development stage, uh, the canopy is pretty small, the leaves are small and the total uh, coverage of, of that uh, field is pretty small in terms of the, the crop. And then as the canola plant um, matures and grows, the canopy gets larger in terms of its biomass and the structure becomes more complicated. On the bottom is a graph from some of our research showing how the degree of polarization changes as this canola um, canopy changes. On the x-axis, we're displaying uh, the day during the growing season. And on the y-axis, uh, is displayed the degree of polarization as a percentage. So we see early in the, the season at the time of leaf development, that the degree of polarization is pretty high, 70 to 90% of the energy scattered is still um, polarized. But we see that as that canopy structure becomes more complicated, the, the canola plant goes into flowering and starts to develop its seeds that the amount of energy that's scattered becomes more unpolarized. So this parameter degree of polarization is really interesting when it comes to monitoring crop development. There are four Stokes parameters. The first Stokes parameter represents the total intensity of the radar backscatter, both the unpolarized and the polarized portion. So the first Stokes parameter is equivalent to a span. There are three additional Stokes parameters, um, one, two, and three. And these uh, other three Stokes parameters describe the properties of the polarized portion um, of the electromagnetic field. So let's talk about those other three Stokes parameters. Um, these are a little bit difficult to understand exactly from a canopy perspective of what is driving these responses. And what we have found is that it's most informative to try to interpret the responses from these Stokes parameters together. I did, or I have provided the, the definition of each of these Stokes parameters. So the Stoke, first Stokes parameters parameter is the difference in uh, power of the two receive channels, in our case, um, H and B. Uh, Stokes parameter two is the dominance of uh, the linear polarization at 45 degree inclination over um, a negative 45 inclined linear polarization. The third Stokes parameter is the dominance of right versus uh, left-handed circular. But it's really the behavior of these Stokes parameters together as the crops develop that are quite interesting. On this view graph, I've, I've provided an example from a wheat field uh, on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, an example of how these three Stokes parameters are behaving for a canola field. 
Again, on the x-axis, this is day during the growing season. And on the right, on the y-axis, uh, these are the Stokes parameters um, displayed in their, their absolute values. And I've highlighted for both crops, different developmental stages. Um, and the, the third Stokes parameter is the solid line and Stokes parameter one and two are the dash, those are the dash lines. And what we see is that again, as these uh, crop canopies are undergoing um, structural changes, that the behavior of these Stokes parameters are also changing. So this can also be informative in terms of uh, tracking crop development. Uh, the degree of linear, linear polarization is not the same as the degree of polarization. Degree of linear polarization references only the polarized scattering and measures the percentage of this polarized scattering, which is linearly polarized. Uh, so this is not only horizontal and vertically polarized, but it could be any linear polarization regardless of that orientation angle. So we can think of, for example, if there are linear features in the canopy, um, that the degree of linear polarization may be higher. And think back to those photos of the soybean, wheat, a canola and corn, and the fact that the dominance of linear structures um, are different among those different crop types. And the linearity of that canopy structure is also going to change as the crops develop. Um, and again, on the right hand side is an example from Sentinel-1 data <clears throat> from that first week in August where we've calculated the degree of linear polarization. Uh, entropy, uh, this, uh, of course, we know that Claude Poche developed um, the uh, Claude Poche decomposition that provides entropy alpha and anisotrophy products from fully polymetric data. Uh, Cloud subsequently developed a dual polarization version of this decomposition method that can be applied to, for example, Sentinel-1 SLC data. And again, think back to the fact that our covariance matrix um, has only four elements. That limits the information we can derive from this decomposition to um, only entropy and alpha. Entropy is a measure of the randomness of scatter from point to point within the target. And it's really uh, defining the predictability and scattering characteristics. And these, this predictability is going to decline as crop canopies develop. <clears throat> So think about this, if I have an agricultural field, um, what is the predictability of how that radar uh, microwave will scatter from point to point? So you can think about early in the season when that canopy is quite small and there's a lot of soil showing that the scattering will be more predictable. But as that canopy structure develops and becomes more complicated, it will be more difficult to predict how the microwave will scatter from point to point within a, within a canopy. A Shannon entropy is also a very interesting uh, parameter that can be derived from uh, polymetric data. And this per particular parameter is the sum of two contributions related to intensity as well as the degree of polarization. We know that crop canopies will uh, create um, many different scattering mechanisms. Um, so within a crop canopy, we may have some single bounce scattering from the soil or from a large leaf. Um, but as the crop canopy grows, we're likely to see more double and multiple uh, scattering occurring. But the point here is that within a crop canopy, there are likely going to be um, uh, several different uh, scattering uh, mechanisms. Alpha angle tells us which of these scattering mechanisms is dominant. So again, early in the season when we have more soil and a smaller canopy, we may have a dominance of single bounce scattering, but as that canopy develops, we can, um, we can anticipate that multiple and double bounce scattering are likely to uh, increase. And again, on the right hand side for uh, this date in August from Sentinel-1, you can see um, the calculation of what scattering mechanism is dominant on these agricultural fields. Uh, this view graph shows on the left hand side the normalized Shannon entropy. So we've just normalized that uh, Shannon entropy between zero and one. And what's immediately obvious is the richness of the information from this parameter. And we can see that most certainly the Shannon entropy is detecting differences in crop type from field to field. 
Um, but even within fields, uh, we can see that that Shannon entropy is detecting um, differences in the development of those crops. So this is a really interesting parameter. Um, on the on the left hand side, this is the second eigenvalue. Um, so that's the sum of the first and second eigenvalue um, represents the um, the total power. And the second eigenvalue uh, expresses half the intensity of the unpolarized component of the scattered wave. So while the degree of linear polarization describes the linearity of the polarized scattering, the second eigenvalue is capturing the amount of unpolarized scattering. The reason that I've displayed this particular parameter is that in our modeling, we have found that the second eigenvalue um, has some sensitivity to crop development specifically um, during specific points in those crop development stages. I mentioned uh, feature selection as an option. As I just described, uh, we can derive a number of different uh, polymetric parameters from the Sentinel-1 SLC data from our two by two covariance matrix. However, we know that these parameters can be cross -co correlated and can offer redundant information. And if we have a large number of variables um, that are, are highly correlated and we have a large number of these variables, this can result in model overfitting. Um, so there is an option here once we've derived this set of SAR um, parameters uh, to do a feature selection. Uh, so this can be done by applying feature selection algorithms. There are a number of algorithms available. We've used the lasso um, algorithm as an example. So you can pre-select the features um, to remove redundant uh, features, or you can allow the machine learning models to select the best features as well. During this webinar, webinar, we're not going to go through this feature selection, um, but this is an option for you at this point um, to, to reduce the number of parameters going into the modeling. Okay, so we have um, uh, pre-processed -pre our Sentinel data. We have derived all of our um, quasi-polymetric parameters that I just described. Um, our other source of data that's needed in this calibration is NDVI. Um, so in this particular um, exercise, we're using Sentinel-2 to calculate NDVI. In our modeling, we have applied this to uh, six different crop types. So we have developed calibration equations for each of these six crop types. And we've, we've also developed a global calibration model as well. Um, so again, pre-processing, derive the SAR polymetric parameters from Sentinel-1 SLC data and NDVI from Sentinel-2. At that point, consider whether you want to apply feature selection to reduce the number of uh, parameters going into the modeling. And we've done this modeling on a, an image segment basis. So we've taken our NDVI products from Sentinel-2 and applied a segmentation process to create objects within um, our image. And the reason to do this is because uh, even after pre-processing, there is likely to be residual noise from some of the uh, SAR uh, parameter products. And we've created this on a, on a segment or object base for this reason. Uh, you could also use field boundaries to define um, uh, your objects, but we've applied a segmentation because even within one agricultural field, we may have differences in crop growth. And so we allowed those differences in vegetation response to drive uh, the, the creation of these objects. So once we've created our objects, either segments or field boundaries, the next step is to calculate the mean radar response for each of those uh, polarimetric parameters, as well as the mean NDVI. And again, we've done this on a crop by crop basis and also to create a global calibration um, equation. Uh, when we started this research a few years ago, we started with a simple linear regression. So we would take one SAR uh, parameter and um, regress it against uh, NDVI. And of course, there are many limitations for this. It's a less robust method. Um, and as well, we can only use one radar response. And as we just saw, there are, there's a richness of data in all of these polymetric parameters. And because of that, we turned to machine learning algorithms um, to create a more robust um, an inclusive type of algorithm. We've tried different machine learning models. 
uh, neural networks, LS Boost, and Random Forest. And in this training, we're going to fo focus on the Random Forest. Emily will show you um, how to uh, create that calibration uh, model within uh, Random Forest. And the reason is that um, the results from our Random Forest modeling have been comparable to these other results, and Random Forest is a pretty easy um, algorithm to, to implement in many different software. Okay, next what we are going to do is uh, I'm going to explain uh, the fitting of the SAR vegetation index to uh, the crop structure dynamics model. And there's a very important reason why we want to bring the SAR vegetation index into this model. Uh, if we don't do this fitting, we are limiting the estimates of our crop condition from the SAR satellite to only when the SAR satellite is collecting data, and we don't want to do that. And so what the dynamics model allows us to do is to estimate crop condition on a daily time step. The model is displayed here, um, and it allows us to provide uh, a better temporal information, daily estimates, and we still retain the subfield estimates because we're using Sentinel-1 data. Um, the crop structure dyna dynamics model has two components. There's a component that describes um, the, uh, the growth of the crop canopy and a component of the model that, de that describes the senescence of the model. Uh, the parameters in the model are uh, as follows. D is the canopy structural descriptor. In our case, D is the SAR vegetation index that we have calibrated against NDVI using our machine learning algorithm. In our case, uh, for this webinar, the random forest um, regressor. T is the accumulated growing degree days. And in Canada, we set the, the start of our growing season to uh, May the 1st. Uh, as such, the only inputs uh, into the crop structure dynamics model um, are the calibrated SAR vegetation index and growing degree days. And then there are uh, several coefficients that will have to be determined. Um, and we've used uh, the least square method uh, to, uh, to determine these, these coefficients. On the right-hand side is an example of output from the crop structure dynamics model. This is an example from canola. We have many different lines and different points on this graph, and this represents the vegetation condition for those individual segments I talked about. Or if you were using field boundaries, these would represent the vegetation index for each field. In this graph, on the x-axis, we're displaying the growing degree days, and on the y-axis, the vegetation condition. The red dots represent the SAR vegetation uh, condition estimated uh, from the Sentinel-1 parameters, and we're um, displaying the, uh, the optical NDVI in green just as a point of comparison. And you can immediately see that when you compare the optical uh, vegetation index to the SAR calibrated vegetation index, that there is very close correlation between uh, those two estimates. A little bit about growing degree days. Uh, so growing degree days are the average daily maximum and minimum temperatures minus the base temperature. Uh, the base temperature is the threshold below which little crop growth will occur, and that's going to vary uh, from crop type. Uh, for Canada, for our region, uh, we set the base temperature to be 5 degrees Celsius. That value will change depending on your geographic location and crop type. Uh, you can download daily maximum and minimum temperatures um, by, from nearby meteorological stations, or you may have other sources of information uh, for that. And then the accumulated growing degree days is calculated by simply summing the growing degree days for each day during the growing season. And uh, in this view graph, there's an example um, of the calculation of accumulated growing degree days. The blue lines represent minimum and maximum uh, temperatures, and the red line represents the accumulation of growing degree, growing degree days throughout um, this region. Uh, so now that we have um, we've created our um, SAR parameters, we have calibrated them against NDVI, we have integrated that SAR vegetation index into our crop structure dynamics model, 
we're able to now estimate crop condition on a daily time step and at a field scale. In this view graph, I'm, dis I'm displaying uh, six uh, examples of the estimate of vegetation condition. Uh, this is for canola, uh, canola crops in, in our test study site. And we're estimating vegetation, vegetation condition between zero and one, just like NDVI would. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, the, the crop structure dynamics model uh, allows us to estimate condition every day. I'm only showing six examples here, six dates. And the reason I picked these six dates is because uh, our team has collected above ground biomass and leaf area uh, measurements. Uh, for test sites in order to understand the relationship between our SAR calibration um, uh, metric and the biophysical parameters uh, that tell us something about crop production. Uh, so what we're doing is calibrating the, um, the SAR vegetation uh, condition estimated from the, the crop structure dynamics model against biomass. Uh, so this is ongoing. We've completed this for canola, but we have these measurements for the other crop types. And we see pretty strong correlations between the vegetation index from SAR and um, above ground biomass, particularly in that early to mid season up to peak growth. So we have um, correlations, correlation coefficients of 0.88. Uh, and we see a weaker correlation, albeit still significant, um, during the period of crop senescence. And that co lower correlation is most likely uh, related to the fact that the canopy is senescing, losing um, canopy water content, and that is also affecting the radar response. Uh, that ends my part of the webinar. These are some references uh, that were contained in the webinar that you can uh, review and, and um, take a look at. And now we will uh, hand the webinar over to Emily and she will walk you through the hands-on exercise. Hello, my name is Emily Lindsay and I am a remote sensing technician and researcher at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Ottawa, Ontario. I am also a PhD candidate at Carleton University, where I use SAR and SAR-derived products for agricultural and native grassland mapping applications. This is a hands-on dem demonstration based on the methodology previously described by my colleague, Dr. Heather McNairn. This demonstration will outline the key steps for building a time series of SAR-calibrated NDVI, adapted from our colleague, Xuanfeng Zhao's 2022 paper in the International Journal of Remote Sensing, titled, Integrating Sentinel-1 SAR and Sentinel-2 optical imagery with a crop structure dynamics model to track crop condition. We will begin this hands-on exercise with a demonstration of the pre-processing steps required to prepare a Sentinel-1 single look complex image in Snap Desktop and export it as a two by two covariance matrix or C2 matrix. We will then demonstrate how to derive some pseudo-polar metric parameters from the C2 matrix of dual polar metric Sentinel-1 data using Polsar Pro. Finally, we will demonstrate how to use random forest regression to get a SAR calibrated NDVI model using Python, and how this regression can be used to predict a daily time step of crop condition using a crop structure dynamics model and growing degree days. To start off, we have downloaded a single image over our Carmen Manitoba site, where we have collected bioma biomass data for four major crop types in the summer of 2019. There are five cloud-free NDVI images for this time period, and an effort was made to find a corresponding Sentinel-1 single look complex image within one to four days of the Sentinel-2 image during the growing season that has the same SAR viewing geometry. In order to calculate polar metric variables from dual polar metric data, a two by two covariance matrix is necessary. Therefore, a single look complex data is required as it retains the phase information as opposed to ground range detected products, which do not. The pre-processing steps in this demonstration are conducted on a July 27, 2019 image. Data can be queried and downloaded over your study site from the ASF Alaska data portal. The resulting .zip file can be read directly by SNAP desktop software. 
If you choose to follow along with this demonstration, you can use an image over your own area of interest or the image used in this demonstration can be queried using the file name at the top of the slide. Here are the steps from which we generate the quasi-polar metric variables from Sentinel-1, SLC data, and SNAP Desktop, and Pulsar Pro. The following is a demonstration of the steps to extract these parameters and use them in a random forest regression in Python to fit the quasi-polar metric variables to corresponding Sentinel-2 calculated NDVI values to create a SAR calibrated NDVI for a specific crop type. In this case, the SAR calibrated NDVI is specific to corn fields in the study area. The random forest regression model is then used with a canopy structure dynamics model and with growing degree days to estimate the condition of the crop at a daily time step in MATLAB. We will start off by demonstrating the first part of the processing methodology to generate a C2 matrix from our Sentinel-1 SLC image downloaded with coverage over our cornfields at our Carmen Manitoba site, which is done in SNAP desktop. These steps include reducing the image extent to reduce processing time, performing a radiometric and geometric correction, as well as image enhancements and polar metric speckle filtering, filtering to reduce noise in the imagery. During the acquisition, the satellite position is recorded by the Global Navigation Satellite System, which is stored and distributed within the Sentinel-1 uh, product metadata. A precise location of the satellite is needed to correct for any movement in the orbit path of the satellite that can happen during normal operation of the satellite, such as solar wind and gravitational effects. A precise orbit file for Sentinel-1 data can be downloaded from the ESA and is available within 20 days of data acquisition and are accurate to five centimeters. To apply the orbit file in SNAP, select the radar drop-down menu and select apply orbit file from the list of options. The apply orbit file input output parameters should select, you should select your downloaded SLC image zip file as the input file and specify an output folder location and output target file name. As for the processing parameters, select Sentinel Precise Auto Download as the orbit state vector and run the Apply Orbit File Processing tool. Sentinel-1 Interferometric Wide Swath Mode provides an image that is 250 kilometers wide consisting of three subswaths at a five, meter, five by 20 meter resolution in the across track or range direction with nine bursts, nine bursts in the along track or azimuth direction. A top split can be applied to the orbit corrected Sentinel-1 data to select the subswaths and bursts, which apply to your area of interest in order to reduce the processing time by decreasing the extent of the original SLC image coverage. In this case, all of our cornfields fall within the IW2 subswath, so we can exclude the subswaths IW1 and IW3. This will be dependent on the location and size of your local area of interest. But if you're following along, you can select the IW2 subswath. We can further reduce the bursts in the azimuth direction to select only bursts number three to six of nine to further refine our area of interest. To run the top split, select the Sentinel-1 tops from the radar drop-down menu and select the Sentinel-1 top split. Use the orbit corrected image as the input and define the output file location. In the processing parameters tab, choose the appropriate subswath. In this case, I have selected IW2 and reduced the number of image bursts, if appropriate, by sliding the arrows. Select both polarizations and run the Sentinel-1 Sentinel top split tool. Now that the orbit file has been used to correct for positioning errors in the satellite orbit, a radiometric calibration must be performed on the newly refined spatial extent. The radiometric calibration tool can be used to convert the SLC data digital number values to radiometrically corrected backscatter using the level one provided calibration lookup tables. This reduces radiometric bias while preserving intensity and phase channels. To run the radiometric correction, under the radar processing tab in SNAP, select radiometric and then open the calibrate tool under the drop-down menu. 
In the input and output parameters tab, select the Sentinel-1 top split file as the input file and specify an output file path. Under the processing parameters tab, select both polarizations and select save as a complex output in order to preserve the phase information of the SLC data. Click run on the calibration tool. Sentinel-1 TOPS deburst tool is used to reduce the image distortion between burst lines in the image. The deburst tool resamples and merges the bursts into a common pixel spacing grid and removes the burst lines as shown in the bottom image. To open the deburst tool, under the radar processing tab, select Sentinel-1 TOPS, Sentinel-1 TOPS deburst, and open the tool. In the input and output parameters of the deburst tool, select the calibrated output file from the previous step and define an output target file. Select both polarizations in the processing parameters tab. Now run the tool and inspect both the processed and unprocessed image to ensure that the burst lines have been removed. Polarimetric filtering is the next processing step. Polarimetric speckle filtering is done as opposed to regular speckle, speckle filtering in order to preserve phase and polarimetric information while also suppressing noise. The output of the polarimetric speckle filter in SNAP is also converted to the covariance matrix, which is another necessary processing step. SNAP has four polarimetric speckle filtering alg algorithms built into the polar polarimetric speckle filter, filter tool, including Boxcar, Intensity Driven Adaptive Neighborhood, Refined Lee, and the Improved Lee Sigma filter. It is important to note that there's no correct filter to choose, and they all reduce noise in a different way. An ideal speckle filter reduces noise while preserving linear features and texture information. Choose the algorithm and window size that is best suited to your application. In this case, we have selected the Boxcar filter with a 7 by 7 window size. Generally, for agricultural applications in the prairies of Canada, we are looking at very large fields, so we can get away with larger speckle, speckle filter window size for noise reduction. A smaller window size preserves small and linear features, while a larger window creates a more homogeneous output. To run the polar metric speckle filtering algorithm, select the deburst image as the input file under the input output parameters tab and define an output target file path. Select the speckle filtering algorithm and the window size. In this case, we have used a boxcar filter with a seven by seven window. Run the tool and inspect the results. Additionally, it is suggested that you could compare the qualitative performance of multiple window sizes and algorithms at this step before processing all of your Sentinel-1 images. Geometric terrain correction converts the raw single look complex data to a coordinate system while also correcting for terrain distortion from elevation differences using a digital elevation model. Geometric terrain correction also resamples the image from azimuth by range degree distance to a meter pixel spacing. Non-terrain corrected imagery is shown as the speckle filtered image from the previous step in the top image which is obviously not projected to a coordinate system. The output of the terrain correction is reoriented, inversed, and flipped when compared to the non-terrain corrected image. To run the range correction tool, under the radar drop-down menu, select the geometric option, followed by the terrain correction, and finally select the range Doppler terrain correction tool. Once the tool is open, Select the appropriate input and output parameters. Under the Processing Parameters tab, select both of the source bands and select the SRTM one second HGT, which is automatically downloaded for the location of your image by SNAP. Select Bilinear Interpolation as the resampling method and the appropriate pixel spacing in meters. Leave all other options as the default unless required. Do not select apply a radiometric normalization. To, to save time and complete batch processing tasks in SNAP, all of the preceding processing steps can be set up in SNAP, 
Graph Builder to automate the pre-processing workflow. This is especially useful when a large number of image, images need to be processed. Just be sure to select all of the correct input and output parameters and processing parameters for each tool. A saved graph can then be run through the batch processing tool to save time. The final step in SNAP Desktop is to export the train corrected C2 matrix for use in Pulsar Pro, as well as to export the train corrected image as a GeoTIFF for use as a master georeferenced image when converting from the Pulsar Pro format back to GeoTIFF. To export an image from SNAP, under the File tab, select the Export Options. Navigate to the SAR Format Options to the Pulsar Pro format. Export to a new working folder location and name the new folder C2. Also export the processed file as a GeoTIFF to another folder location. Next, navigate to your exported C2 folder and open the config.txt file in Notepad. Here we're going to edit the polar type from dual to PP2 as shown, and we're going to save the file. This allows Pulsar Pro to recognize the data as a two by two matrix. The following steps are to be completed in Pulsar Pro, including the extraction of quasi-polar metric par parameters from the C2 matrix. If you have not already downloaded Pulsar Pro onto your machine, download it from the provided link and be sure to follow the instruction, installation instructions carefully. This demonstration uses the Pulsar Pro version 6.0.3 or the biomass edition of the software. You will also need to download all of the packages and dependencies on the right if they are not already installed on your machine. After importing the covariance mat matrix into Pulsar Pro and setting up our environment, Pulsar Pro will be used to extract the matrix elements, Stokes components and child parameters, and decomposition parameters used to calibrate to NDVI. Once Pulsar Pro is downloaded and installed correctly, open the Pulsar Pro bio from the main menu of the software. Under the Environment tab of the Biomass version 1 program, select Single Dataset and navigate to your working C2 folder containing the edited configuration text file. If everything has been done correctly, the bottom left of the biomass tool should show that Pulsar Pro can correctly read the C2 matrix and all of the other options should be now selectable under the toolbar. The first parameters we are going to calculate in Pulsar Pro are the covariance matrix elements C11, C22, and span. Under process matrix elements, the input and output directories are already specified. So you may change the output folder to a new folder if necessary. First, we're going to process, we're going to select to process C11 or VV modulus, C22 or VH modulus, and span linear matrix elements parameters. Modulus is the linear representation of the C2 matrix amplitude, and span is the total power or intensity of the sum of all matrix elements. Once the tool is run, you will see the new matrix, ele matrix elements in your C2 folder along with the original files. Using the covariance matrix, we are able to calculate the four Stokes parameters in Pulsar Pro. From these Stokes parameters, we can calculate several secondary Stokes parameters that describe the nature of the scattered wave. To generate the Stokes parameters, under the Process tab, select Polarimetric Functionalities 1 and open the Stokes Parameters Processing tool. Select the input and output directories for your C2 folder. You can choose the parameters to generate. These are our suggested Stokes parameters as they were described by Heather. Under the Stokes components, select all four Stokes components. Under the Stokes options for Stokes angles, select orientation and ellipticity angle. 
As for the wave descriptors, eigenvalues L1 and L2 can be selected as well as the degree of linear polarization and the linear polarization ratio. You must also select the processing window size. In this case, we have selected a five by five processing window. Next, we're gonna generate entropy and alpha decomposition parameters. Under the processing menu, select the entropy anistrophy alpha decomposition tool. So choose the appropriate input and output directories and select the following parameters to generate alpha, entropy, and Shannon entropy. Use the same processing window size as you used previously um, as the Stokes parameter tool. And when the tool is run, check to see that the process parameters are stored correctly in the C2 folder. Once the parameters have all been written to your C2 folder, the next step is to convert the Pulsar Pro dot bin files back into a geodiff, geotiff output so that we can process and extract the values for our own corn fields for each of the calculated quasi-polar metric parameters. There are several ways to do this, but we have found that the easiest way to convert from the Pulsar Pro image format to a geotiff, which is more easily read by other image processing software, is to use GDAL and Python. Pulsar Pro does not read or interpret georeferenced information. For this reason, we have to convert back to the original format and use the master georeference geotiff reference file that we exported from SNAP when we also exported the C2 matrix. The script in this example uses GDAL and Python 3.6 or greater to write the individual .bin files to the C2 folder to geotiff. You will also need to create a list of all your parameters as file names for the script to read. In this example, I have used Spider in the Anaconda environment to run this script, but any Python IDE will work as long as GDAL is installed correctly and Python 3.6 or greater is used. The only changes made to the script are the parameters at the bottom of the script, where you must specify the directory of the input C2 folder and the directory to save the files that are converted to GeoTIFF. Before we get into completing the random forest regression to calibrate the SAR parameters to NDVI, it is important to note that you must extract the average NDVI from Sentinel-2 and the SAR parameter values to an object. In this case, an object-based image segmentation was performed to delineate subfield level objects from optical imagery. These objects were then used to extract the mean values of all calculated SAR parameters. In our example, the Sentinel-2 NDVI images were used. All NDVI images were used in a multi-resolution image segmentation in eCognition Developer. An object-based segmentation approach using optical data is strongly suggested as a method for generating subfield objects. This reduces the amount of speckle in the data that is inherent in SAR and limits the effects of field-level heterogeneity. Alternatively, you could also use a poly polygon delineation of your field boundaries for your chosen crop type that is human generated, but it would, be, but it would preferably be at the subfield level in order to target areas of spectral homogeneity and limit within field variations. Once we have our objects for the surveyed corn fields in our study area, we performed a mean zonal extraction from each raster image parameter to the object level. In order to create a table of mean values for Sentinel-1 image data and corresponding Sentinel-2 NDVI images. The final format for the CSV table is as follows. The table should contain an ID value for the corn subfield object, followed by a field with the date of the image acquisition. The Y variable for the random forest regression is our known Sentinel-2 NDVI value for each of our subfield objects. Finally, we have our 17 SAR parameters, which are our calculated Sentinel-1 parameters that will be used to create the SAR calibrated NDVI, random forest regression model. As you can see in the format of the corn CSV table demonstrated on the right, 
There is an NDVI value followed by a value extracted from all of our Sentinel-1 parameters. The following demonstrates a simple standalone Python script for random forest regression. Random forest was selected as the method for regression. Random forest is an ensemble learning approach which can, which can be applied to classifications and regression problems and is useful in capturing nonlinear relationships. The script included in this demonstration was created in Google Colab and uses scikit-learn for random forest regression as the package random forest regressor. The dependency the dependencies for the script are a CSV table with the format explained in the previous slide and as shown below. Scikit-learn is an open source machine learning library that supports supervised and unsupervised learning. It also provides various tools for model fitting, data pre-processing, model selection, model evaluation, and many other utilities. Our corn dataset table contains the 17 calculated Sentinel-1 variables and Sentinel-2 and DVI values at the object level for corresponding Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 image dates. The objects are identified in the first data column, followed by an image date variable and corresponding Sentinel-2 and DVI value. A cloud-free Sentinel-2 image corresponding to the Sentinel-1 variables must ideally be, be within one to four days of the Sentinel-1 acquisition. The rest of the variables in the table are the average SAR parameters at the subfield object level for each of the corn fields in our reference data set as they were calculated in Pulsar Pro. The first part of the script imports the necessary packages in the CSV data file for our corn fields at our study site. We use NumPy to convert the data set into an array and to define the independent and dependent variables in the data set. It is important to perform any data quality checking at this point as the random forest regression algorithm will not run with any unknown data values. Next, the data set is then randomly split into training and testing data sets. In this case, 30% of samples are removed from the data set for the final validation step. The random forest regression is then run on the 70% of training um, data, the 70% the of training samples with a number of trees set to 500. This value should be changed to reflect the minimum value where error converges in the random forest model. Next, we predict with the model with the model and calculate the model accuracy and mean absolute error using the test data set retained in step three. In this example, this model used all input variables, which can be used as a baseline to investigate feature importance and test the implementation of a variable reduction method or strategy to improve the random forest regression model accuracy. In this example, as you can see, we have two features of higher variable importance for predicting NDVI, which are the C22 or VH modulus variable and the Stokes child parameter, the first eigenvalue. This information can be used to tune the random forest regression model and reduce data dimensionality. With a relatively no, low number of input variables, however, that are all from the same input data source, as well as the high degree of model accuracy, further variable selection methods were not explored or implemented. Once the SAR calibrated NDVI is calculated using random forest regression, the calculated estimates or the blue dots on the figure on the right were fit to the canopy structure dynamics model to create a daily time series curve by growing degree day that represents seasonal corn crop growth and condition. The lines of the model are curve fitted using the crop structure dynamic model to interpolate a daily time series using the equation shown. In this case, it was programmed in MATLAB. The crop structure dynamics model fit with the Sentinel-1 SAR calibrated NDVI captures the temporal trend expected as corn growth progresses and as the corn senesces and rapidly loses water. 
In the early season, crops develop rapidly, leading to peak biomass mid-season, followed by a period of senescence, and finally harvest. In this equation, D is the canopy structural descriptor, which is set as the SAR calibrated NDVI value, where T is the accumulative growing degree days for Canada from May 1st. The model describes the canopy structure in two parts, canopy growth and senescence. The growth period is defined by a logistic equation with parameters B and TI. The coefficient B is the relative growth rate at the inflection point of TI. The senescence is defined by an exponential equation with a parameter A and TS. A is the senescence rate. TS represents the accumulative growing degree days at which D decreases to zero due to senescence. Some variation in the model is expected as the geographic area of Carmen, Manitoba is a large area and has variability within the soil types. There's also variability in terms of growth, crop growth phenology. The relationship between Sentinel-1 derived crop condition and biomass can be statistically assessed using samples measuring above ground biomass at different stages of growth to determine model correlation and sensitivity. Here are some additional references and contributors that helped to prepare this tutorial. I would just like to say thank you to those of you who attended this session on monitoring crop growth parameters through synthetic aperture radar derived structural parameters. We look forward to your questions. Thank you. Emily, thank you for that wonderful demonstration on the pre-processing of Sentinel-1 images in SNAP, deriving quasi-polar metric parameters using Pulsar Pro, and creating a random forest regression for a SAR calibrated NDVA model using Python. Before we transition to the question and answer portion of today's training, we encourage you to enter your questions in the question and answer box, and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage before the start of next week's training. As a recap of what we've covered throughout this entire webinar series, in part one, we learned how to identify crops using a polar metric SAR time series from Sentinel-1 using random forest and k-means machine, machine learning algorithms in Python Jupyter Notebook. In part two, we learn more about processing and exploring a time series of imagery with Sentinel Hub and its statistical API, and machine learning capabilities with EOLearn and EO Workflow. In the final part of the webinar series, we learn the rationale for developing a SAR vegetation index, discussed how the SAR vegetation index is calibrated to the normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI, and provided a demonstration for pre-processing Sentinel-1 imagery in SNAP deriving quasi-polar metric parameters in Pulsar Pro, and calibrate a SAR vegetation index with NDVI. Below is the contact information for Heather, Emily, and Shen Feng, along with links to the training webpage, website, and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar and the entire webinar series, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications for future trainings, and follow us on Twitter for exciting announcements from NASA's Earth Sciences. want to thank everybody that's been submitting their questions for the uh, for this question and answer portion of today's webinar series. Uh, we've been getting some really great ones and we do encourage you if you have one, uh, please do uh, submit it in the Q&A box and we will try to get to them in the remaining time that we have. So jumping right into it, uh, first question we have uh, pertains to one of the CSV files that was shared uh, in the data folder from today's training. So I guess this is for the uh, the corn CSV file for regression. And the question is, could you explain how this data was collected? So the corn CSV file contains um, the extracted pseudo polarimetric variables derived from the Sentinel-1 imagery. So it was given to you basically as sort of um, a placeholder if you found anything confusing about the first pre-processing steps. That's just the uh, this, the Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 NDVI and the Sentinel-1 polar metric um, variables that are derived um, to the object level or the subfield level for those um, corn fields. So it can Great. be used to um, run the random forest regression if you want. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, question number two, how can we distinguish crop and forest types using SAR data? Can any, 
can any indices available, like the radar vegetation index, et cetera, or any polar metric combination be used to do so? Uh, yep, Sean, I'm gonna answer this one. Um, uh, so we have provided some previous RSAT training and um, the RSAT folks can provide you links to this on how to use a SAR data to classify crop types. And of course, you know, we've been um, specifically addressing in our team a crop classification. Um, but although we're not, you know, our research is not focused on other land cover types, the same types of principles, um, you know, would apply. And that is that uh, what will be very important in using SAR for general land cover classification is to make sure that you have a good time series of SAR data uh, to perform that classification. Uh, what we found in our research, uh, in addition to having a dense time series of, of SAR data to capture the, you know, the, the changes in the, the land cover over time, uh, that, that polarimetry and multi-frequency radar can be uh, quite helpful in the classification. To be honest, the role of polarimetry is still evolving, um, and even the training that we did today, you, you can see you know, some very new research results using polarimetry. Um, but what we have found, at least in crop classifications, if you look at things like uh, the Stokes vectors, there are four Stokes vectors, as we discussed in this uh, seminar, uh, webinar, that those Stokes vectors can be quite helpful in, in classifications. Um, and, and also multi-frequency radar is gonna be very helpful, especially in dis distinguishing between forestry and, and crop uh, cover would be my, my speculation. And we know that NISAR is, will be launched very soon. And um, I really think uh, integrating some of that LBAN data from NISAR with Sentinel-1 um, would be very helpful for this type of classification. Wonderful, great, thank you so much, Heather. Uh, question number three, please help me to interpret any polar metric decomposition result generated using Pulsar Pro. My doubt is it's uh, example given volumetric ranges in zero to 255, like eight bit data. How do you convert it into DB scale or linear as generated in SNAP? Um, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, so if you're getting a data range from 0 to 255, uh, my suggestion would be to review your processing chain, because if processing was done correctly, the polarimetric parameters that were calculated in Pulsar Pro should be in decibels. Um, but if you have further issues with this, please contact us for further clarification, and we can look at your individual um, data and your processing steps. Great, Emily, thank you so much. Question number four, what are the limitations of SAR for agriculture and water resources monitoring? Is SAR data available for researchers? Uh, so I'll, I'll answer this one, Sean. Um, I, honestly, we weren't quite sure what you meant by limitations. Uh, you can contact us if, if you have further uh, further questions, but um, I'll, I'll just address the part on the availability of SAR data. Uh, so in terms of data access, um, you know, really Sentinel-1, and I just mentioned NISAR as another example, you know, these data are a, a great data source. They're free and open and fairly easy to access, um, as you saw in this, this webinar. Um, so that part was, uh, in terms of data access for Sentinel-1, was covered by Emily on the hands-on section. And if you have any issues on how to access the data, just, just contact her for that. Um, but as I said, there are a lot of new sensors coming on board. A lot of the data uh, policies are now um, providing data free and open, um, such as NISAR. But um, as I said, if you have any further questions on limitations, uh, just reach out to our team and, and we can uh, help you with that. Terrific. Thank you, Heather. Question number five, is it possible to estimate crop phenology only from SAR, from a SAR image? Uh, yes, it is. And I think I've made this comment on previous webinars that I'm, I'm always amazed at uh, the advancements in radar and that we're able to do things with, with radar that, quite frankly, a couple of decades ago, I wouldn't have thought was possible. But this is one actually that we have been able to demonstrate. Uh, so we have been 
uh, collaborating with a Canadian company, and that company has been able to um, to develop a machine learning model that uh, uses both growing degree days and a radar data, only radar data, uh, to estimate uh, crop phenology. So in this particular uh, example, uh, they were integrating C and X band data. Um, uh, we'll provide in the answers to the questions uh, some uh, references, so I will provide the reference to that paper that was published. Um, that specific paper that you'll see is related to canola phenology, so here we were estimating what we call the BBCH scale for crop, uh, um, crop development phenology. Uh, uh, for canola, but uh, the, the company has since um, advanced uh, that machine learning algorithm and demonstrated that we can accurately estimate phenology for other crops such as corn, soybeans, and wheat. And we have a publication that's in preparation for uh, related to that. Thanks, Heather. Uh, question number six. Please provide some insights into dual pole entropy alpha and full pole entropy alpha. Uh, so I will answer this one um, as well. Um, so Cloud developed a, a dual uh, pole entropy alpha decomposition method, um, and we'll provide the reference for that publication, um, which is what we've applied to this to the Sentinel One um, complex data. Uh, this is different than the entropy anisotropy and alpha decomposition, um, like the cloud uh, cloud Poitier de decomposition applied to quad fold data. Uh, from our experience, and again, this is still an area of research. Uh, you know, the the entropy alpha from the dual pole versus the fully polymetric data are correlated, but the values are not exactly the same. So I wouldn't consider them as interchangeable. Um, so evaluating the differences between uh, what we get from compact pole uh, or quad pole data, or sorry, the what we're getting from uh, fully polymetric quad pole data versus uh, dual pole, it's it's still under investigation. And this is why in the, the webinar, we chose to refer to these dual pole parameters as quasi or pseudo polymetric, uh, whether that's a, a great way to refer to them, but that's just a way to remind ourselves that uh, what we're deriving from the dual pole are not um, exactly equivalent or, or interchangeable with the quad pole data. Great, question some, seven refers to if this workflow that you're using can also be used for a mixed cropping or grasslands with mixed grassland field. Uh, um, okay, so the, the workflow, I think, uh, you know, what we've demonstrated in terms of, you know, downloading the data, extracting the polymetric variables, um, you know, even the calibration approach um, can be applied to, you know, different land covers. So I think that the, the workflow uh, could be applied. Um, but if you're looking to create like a vegetation condition index, um, you'll have to develop a, a, a different calibration equation. I think in the, the webinar, we, we talked about the fact that um, we've developed individual calibration equations for individual crop types. Um, so they are a bit different depending on the crop type, although we, we, we have been trying to develop a global calibration equation, which is less accurate as you can imagine. Um, so, you know, in addition to, uh, like I said, the workflow is the same, but you'll have to create your own calibration equation. Um, in addition, there, there may be limitations in using, you know, only C-band radar data for other land cover types. Um, so you might look towards other frequencies as well, like X or, or L band might yield better results depending on, you know, your, your particular land cover type. Um, and as I mentioned before, we started this research with canola, but we have found that, you know, the workflow and that the results are very comparable for, for other crop types as well. So this is a great, um, you know, area of potentially uh, future, future research. Great, thanks, Heather. Question number eight uh, looks like it refers to rice cultivation. Is there a different processing channel for retrieving SAR data from a flooded paddy field? How is it different from collecting SAR data from dryland crops? Uh, again, I think it's similar to the previous question um, in terms of 
you know, the data processing and the, and the workflow, I think the same workflow can be applied. Um, but again, this would this is not something we've looked at. You would have to test, um, you know, the calibration of uh, to create this SAR vegetation index for your particular uh, your particular site. So for a flooded paddy rice, the, the workflow should be the same. But um, you'll you'll have to test to see how well uh, this this SAR vegetation index uh, would be able to determine rice condition. Great, and question number nine. I would like to know if the polarimetric data can also be used in small tillages from 0.5 to 2 hectares to discriminate between crops and small tillages with multiple crops. Um, so this 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 could be an interesting research project. So um, in theory, the scattering that we, the scattering characteristics that we see from vegetation are gonna be very different than bare soils. Uh, so as you saw in the webinar from vegetation, we expect a greater presence of, of volume scattering and a greater degree of entropy or randomness in the scattering. So this would be quite different if you're looking at, you know, vegetation, vegetated um, uh, fields versus bare fields. Um, I also wanted to point out, uh, our team is also looking at tillage uh, as an area of, of active research uh, for radar. Um, and we're, we're looking at uh, strictly the phase information and a method called coherent change detection to flag when fields are tilled. Um, and we've seen some success in this, and this is because as farmers till their fields, the phase or the difference between the sensor and the field changes because the height of the soil is changing due to these tillage activities. So I think to answer the question, um, you know, the, the polymetric response should be different between crop fields and tilled fields, but even within tilled fields, there might be something interesting in looking at uh, changes in phase over time. Great, question number 10. I imagine wind can affect the radar backscatter return. How do you differentiate genuine changes in crop structure from changes caused by wind? Uh, so I think this is a this is a good observation, um, and we know, um, for example, that that uh, that phase can change due to the movement of crops by wind. So this is why, for example, in coherent change detection, it can be a bit tricky when we have uh, vegetation present because. The wind is is moving the canopy and changing the phase, so it's likely going to have some um, some effect. Uh, however, with our research, um, you know, we've found a, a very strong correlation between phenology. I described that in a previous question, um, and phenology is is very much dependent on the structure of the crop canopy. So there's a strong correlation between phenology and these polymetric parameters. So it's true that wind is likely going to create some changes in the, the SAR canopy, but really the overwhelming change in the structure as the crops are growing is what, what is going to you know, drive the radar response. Um, it's possible though, I mean, none of these models are perfect. There are some error associated with, with the calibration and the polymetric responses. So it is possible that some of the errors that we're seeing uh, in the modeling are, are due to this type of um, effect. Um, and I'll provide a, a paper where um, where we we've, we've done this research that relates um, crop structure and phenology to polymetric responses. So you can uh, take a look at that paper. Okay, question eleven. What does the VV decimal uh, gamma and VV linear gamma mean in Sentinel Hub EO? How can we get the interfer interferogram and understand the heights? I'll take a stab at this one. Um, so we did not use interferometry to get vegetation height for this project. Um, instead, we're calibrating the SAR-derived polarimetric variables uh, to Sentinel-2 NDVI to estimate crop condition, not the crop height. And if you have any further questions on that, uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you, Emily. Question number 12. Can SAR data be used to identify a spreading of invasive species among the crop? 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll answer that one, Sean. And I have to say, I really like the questions where people are, are you know, thinking about the application of radar in other areas. So um, this is really uh, exciting to hear all these ideas that are coming out in the questions. Um, we're, we haven't looked at that in, in our particular uh, research team um, in terms of can we identify invasive species uh, in fields and differentiate those from crops. So I'll take a, just an educated guess at that, that, that it, it may be possible to do that. Um, I think it's going to depend on a couple of things. Um, as I've been talking about, the, the structure of, of vegetation is really uh, important in terms of how the radar is, is responding. And so if you look at an invasive species, for example, if this uh, you know, canopy has, or this vegetation canopy has a structure that is, that is different from the surrounding crop, then uh, it may be possible that the radar would, would detect that something was different. Um, you have to think about the spatial extent as well of the invasive species. So um, if the, you know, if the infestation is spatially large enough um, to cover multiple radar pixels, um, then again, it may be possible. But if these are very small patches, um, that will be, you know, more difficult to, uh, to, uh, uh, to identify those invasive species. But it's, it's an interesting, um, uh, it's an interesting problem to look at, I think. Interesting indeed. Uh, question number 13. Originally, NDVI is an optically derived index based on near-infrared and red wavelengths. How can a SAR equivalent index be correlated with optical NDVI? Yeah, and I'll take that one. And this is uh, a really valid question. It's, uh, it's something that, you know, we've, we've answered this question a, a number of times. Again, I'm going to provide you with the original paper that we published on this because we took some, some time in that paper in the introduction to really um, explain, um, you know, how can we link NDVI and SAR because what the, uh, the person posing this question is correct. We think about N NDVI as, you know, reflectance related to things like chlorophyll um, or, you know, internal leaf structure and, and radar is really detecting these larger structural changes in the canopy. So it's a, it's a, valid, uh, it's a valid question. The link is really through um, the crop structure. So even with NDVI, um, we see that as the crop structure changes and we can measure that with things like leaf area index and biomass. So NDVI is correlated with leaf area in index and biomass. And, and there's many, many publications that demonstrate that. But as well, radar response, um, both the polymetric response and, and the scattering are also uh, very correlated with LAI and biomass. And again, there are many publications that uh, that demonstrate that. So it's really this this link in how the canopy structure is changing um, through uh, you know things like LAI and biomass. So the the link between NDVI is really through this the, these structural characteristics. Thanks, Heather. Question fourteen: If we use SAR for crop differentiation, i.e., crop mapping. Will different stages of their development confuse the model? Um, okay, I will answer this one as well. Um, it, it could be the case. Um, for example, one thing that comes to mind is if we're looking at one specific crop type, um, if the, the crops are seeded over um, a longer um, seeding window, uh, then a particular crop like corn, for example, if we're trying to map corn, it could be at a different uh, growth stage, uh, even though the crop type is the same. So it could compl complicate things potentially, um, but it can also help. Um, so uh, this is why time series of, of radars in, in, in is important. Um, so we can think about these changes in um, crop phenology as actually helping us to differentiate one crop type from another. So you can think about it this way. If we only had one radar image, for example, um, the, the structure of the canopy uh, between one crop type and another could be quite similar. You can think about small, small grains as an example. So if we think about wheat or barley or oats, you know, there are points in the growing season when um, the structure of those canopies are very similar. 
And if we only have one or, or two radar images, it's, it will be difficult to differentiate between those different small grains. But as those canopies develop, the crop structures will change. Um, so just like using optical data, we can look at a time series of uh, radar data and its, its ability to detect these changes in crop structure is actually being helpful. So again, it really depends on your, on your particular site. If there's a lot of variation in terms of planting date for a particular crop type, it might complicate things. But on the other hand, um, you know, these changes in crop structure can actually help us separate different crop types as we look at the development of crops over the growing season. Great, question 15. What were the differences you found in accuracy between artificial neural networks and random forest? Um, so again, we'll, we'll provide access to a paper that was published in 2022 <clears throat> that describes the, the differences between um, the, the neural network and random forest. Um, honestly, the correlations were very similar. So um, the correlations between using the, the neural network were um, zero, basically 0.87 versus 0.89, so very, very similar. And the, the, um, the root mean square errors were very similar as well. Uh, so honestly, with our research, we could have used either. We settled on the random forest because it was simpler for us to implement as, as Emily demonstrated. But this is really an area of active research. And I think something that we've learned over the last number of years is that there are a lot of new machine learning or AI algorithms that are being developed. Um, and I would suspect that as others start to delve into some of these um, uh, more advanced algorithms, uh, that you may see improvements um, in the, the outcomes as well. So I wouldn't necessarily limit your research to random forests. You could certainly think about testing some of these other um, more advanced uh, methods. And I, you wouldn't, I wouldn't shy away from using a neural network. It's just, as I said, the results were, were so similar that we just decided to use the random force for simplicity's sake. Question 16. What can be the possible range of a particular scattering type? Example given for an agricultural area having full pole data, what is the possible range of each Yamaguchi 4 component decomposition? Uh, okay, so this question, um, I guess, was clarified a little bit. Um, we weren't quite sure when it was first posted what you were referring to. Um, so I don't have those numbers off the top of my head, but um, when we when we fill out the the written um, the more detailed written answers, we'll we'll take a look at the Yamaguchi. At the time when I looked at this question, I don't think that was clear, but uh, we'll get back to you about that. Great, and question number 17. How do you evaluate the performance of window size using any tool instead of visualiz visualiz visualization only? Um, for this question, uh, the window size of any tool in this uh, workflow can be tested by implementing, say, two to three different window sizes and then comparing the results of the random forest regression to each of those uh, use case scenarios. So my recommendation would be if there's a statistically significant difference in the R squared of the random forest regression, the uh, I would select the best window size with the best R squared value. Uh, but the window size is very specific to your site and cropping system. Um, so the size we might use in our sites in Canada, and spe especially in Western Canada, may or may not be appropriate for your site, specifically if it's a smaller field size. Hopefully that answers your question. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, question 18. The demo shows a great way to process a single image and uses several different software packages uh, to do so. Uh, example, Snap Desktop, Pulsar Pro, Python Google Colab, and MATLAB. What would be the best way to create a single continuous workflow slash pipeline for processing large amounts of data? Uh, this is a great question. Um, in this case, there's, there were strengths to each software selected for each processing stage. Um, and we're also, keep in mind that we're in the research stage of this project. So we are exploring new processing methods 
to simplify and implement this workflow in more operational contexts over larger areas. Um, there's some ongoing work with Pulsar Pro and Snap to develop a dedicated bridge between the two software packages, but it was not operational at the time of this research. Um, but batch processing is available in both Snap and Pulsar Pro. Um, and you can also use Python with Snap and batch process in Pulsar Pro to speed up and automate your workflow to process uh, more images at a time. Thanks, Emily. Question 19, is Pulsar Pro open, soft, open software? Yes, uh, it's an open source software. Um, it can be downloaded at this link here, uh, along with its dependencies, which are also open source. Great, question number 20. Is there any similar method for a normalized difference moisture index, uh, I guess soil moisture, using both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2? Uh, I'll take that question. So uh, we haven't tried that. Um, I, what I would say, uh, however, although again, like the workflow uh, uh, is could be quite similar, um, it's likely that the polymetric parameters that would be helpful for this type of soil moisture mapping are going to be different. So um, here we're looking at volume scattering and and um, polymetric parameters related to um, you know a, a different type of scattering that we then we would see from soil. So uh, if you give this a try, um, you know, make sure that you're looking at the full suite of polymetric parameters to see uh, whether it's intensity or or scattering characteristics, what would be most appropriate for this particular application to soils. Great. Question 21. When we randomly split training and test data sets, how would you manage spatial autocorrelation? I'll take a stab at answering this one. Um, so what I think uh, the author of this question was getting at was um, how we manage spatial autocorrelation in our reference data set. So the spatial autocorrelation was managed by selecting, if so if you're looking at a, a, an agricultural field and we're doing our object-based image segmentation, we're, we're gonna have multiple within field objects because our segmentation is calibrated to do that. Um, so we're only selecting a single subfield object for each um, agricultural field. And that way we're reducing the bias linked to spatial autocorrelation in the reference data itself. And I would recommend um, if you're testing this out in your own um, application and environment to do that as well. Thank you, Emily. Question 22, considering that everything is related to the analysis of vegetation cover, I wonder if you could use Pulsar Pro to analyze other types of cover, for example, buildings. Uh, yep, I'll answer that one. Um, so yeah, obviously we're focused on um, on agricultural land covers. Um, having said that, uh, you know, fully polymetric or as we call it, pseudo polymetric parameters are very rich in information, um, and and things like buildings, for example, will have very different scattering characteristics um, in terms of how the the microwave signal will will scatter and and so uh, I think this is um, you know a very good application for um, uh, polarimetry so I would uh, you know I would encourage uh, you to take a look at Pulsar Pro and and um, Sentinel One SLC data to, uh, to to take a look at the how the scattering is is occurring from from buildings. Question twenty three. I have a question about Sentinel One data selection. Do you select only dry dates and filter with rainy dates in order to avoid the surface moisture in the analysis? Uh, yep, this is always a good question. Um, so it's always very important to um, to assess the the meteorological conditions when we're using radar data because um, you know water on the canopy uh, can certainly change um, how the radar signal responds, especially the intensity. Uh, so we uh, routinely um, monitor. Um, 
uh, rainfall to make sure that we are filtering out or removing dates that um, uh, when the when there is rain uh, rain occurring at the time of the acquisition. That's of course the the biggest issue is is rainfall at the time of acquisition. So that's going to cause a lot of scattering of the radar signal. Um, and we've seen, for example, it creates sort of this washout of of um, uh, of the, the radar signal and it's very difficult to differentiate one field from another due to this this scattering by by the rain droplets um, but as I said you know you also get rain on the canopy even after a heavy rainfall so um, it's always a good idea to take a look at what the conditions were um, immediately following and during the uh, acquisition of the radar Thanks, Heather. Question 24, how do you calculate cumulative growing degree days? Uh, yeah, I think this was explained in the, uh, in the webinar, but, um, you know, we're using um, growing degree days uh, or calculating it from a lo local weather station. So we simply download the temperature data from that, um, from that weather station. I think the formula was provided in the, uh, the webinar. Um, so we use a local weather station. It's not even um, on our site, but just close by. Uh, but there may be other sources of temperature data that, that you could use as well. So just take a look at the formula that we provided uh, in the webinar to do that calculation. Okay, question 25, could non-timber products be classified the same as crops? Um, I'm not. Uh, Oh, yeah, go ahead, Emily. No, go I'll ahead, just, Emily. I'll take a stab at answering this yeah. one. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so it would be possible to use um, non-timber land cover types with this methodology, but at this time, uh, the research was limited to the four crop types that were tested. Okay, question 26. Are they ready to run standard cloud-based are there ready to run cloud-based standard resources to process the NDVI and SAR data in this manner together? If not, do you know of any efforts under development? Um, yes, um, yes and no. So we're unaware of any cloud-based resources available at this time. Um, but if you were to use Google Earth Engine, I would just put the disclaimer that the reason why it's not useful is because Google Earth Engine um, only has the grid, the GRD Sentinel data. So um, you would need the Sentinel one, Sentinel look, single look complex data in order to do um, a lot of these polarimetric processing steps. Um, so right, the answer, sh the short answer is no, that we're not available or unaware of any cloud-based resources at this time, um, but we'd be excited to see if um, any are developed in the coming years. Great. And question 27 is somewhat similar to the last question. Is it possible to do the pre-processing and or the parameters derivation solely in Python without Snap and Pulsar Pro? Are there any open source libraries or scripts? Uh, to my understanding, Snap can be run in a Python environment. So a lot of these um, steps, while I demonstrated using like the GUI and the tools themselves, they can be implemented in a Python environment. Um, but currently there is no substitute for Pulsar Pro for these advanced processing of polar metric data steps. Um, but to my understanding, there is a bridge being developed to implement Pulsar Pro in Snap and Python. So um, one day soon, I think it will be possible to do um, a lot of these steps in Python through Snap. Great, thanks Emily. Question 28, if I understood correctly, SAR NDVI is crop dependent. If so, how does the model account for crop type? Uh, okay, I, I can um, I can answer that. So uh, yes, the uh, what we presented uh, today, we've developed a sort of a calibration equation for each different crop type, and and that's because the structure between those or among those different crop types is so different. Um, so if you were going to implement this, uh, you would need to know, um, you know, what the crop type is, uh, you know, prior to developing this calibration equation or applying the calibration equation. We're working on 
other research to uh, to be able to provide a early season um, crop map. So we would know early in the season what the crop type was, and you could apply the appropriate um, calibration model. Um, you know, having said that, that's it gets a bit complicated. We need to know early in the season what the crop type is, and then apply the appropriate model to the appropriate um, crop type. Uh, we've also, as I mentioned in the webinar, we've looked at developing a global model, which would be one calibration model for, at least for our four crop types, corn, canola, soybeans, and wheat. Um, so we have had success at doing that, um, but what we've seen is that the model is a little bit less accurate if we apply this global model. <clears throat> Excuse me, so that is a bit of a limitation at this point. Thank you, Heather. Question 29. After identifying the highly correlated parameters from SAR, can we proceed with utilizing just those parameters for SAR calibrated MDVI? Uh, Emily, did, I think you yeah. answered this one. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, variable variable reduction strategy can be used to remove variables from the model that do not have a high variable importance. Um, this may result in improved accuracy of subsequent random forest regression scenarios by reducing the correlation and dimensionality, as well as reducing the potential for overfitting in the model. Um, but um, in the case of the publication that we've mentioned a few times, the um, re variable reduction strategy, because we're only using Sentinel-1 variables, there isn't, a, or there already isn't a high dimensionality in the in the data set, so there wasn't a very significant reduction in um, accuracy or increase in accuracy when we chose the um, the variable reduction scenario. So, yes, but it's it's worth looking into for sure. Um, and your so it'll be a case by case scenario. Okay, thanks, Emily. Question thirty. Can we process two bursts at the same time while running split? Sorry, can I just get you to scroll down a little bit for question 30? Uh, so yes, this step is optional if you want to reduce the area of your Sentinel-1 SLC image to a smaller study site or you may not wish to do this because your study area is larger um, so you, and you don't need to cut down on processing time. So anywhere from one to nine bursts can be included in this step or it can be excluded if you don't need to, do, to reduce the number of bursts depending on your, your study area. Thank you, Emily. Question 31. How does a SAR-based vegetation index compare with NDVI in terms of accuracy? Are there any limitations to take note of? Uh, yeah, I can I can answer this. So um, the the SAR calibrated NDVI for corn and canola have have correlations uh, R scores of greater than eighty five percent. So I want to make note of a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, you know we do want to understand you know, really what does the SAR vegetation index tell us about um, crop condition? And that's why, as I mentioned in the webinar, we've been collecting biomass samples in situ uh, so that we can really understand, um, you know, how well the SAR vegetation index is reflective of, uh, of, of the crop condition on the ground, the biomass, the, the above ground biomass. So I think we presented some uh, results in the, the webinar for that. Um, We've, uh, you know, we've completed this uh, this calibration, this RBI um, calibration for the four crop types I've mentioned before, and we've done correlations with biomass. So again, we understand um, how they're performing, and we have a publication forthcoming. You know, having said that, the question on are there any limitations to to take note of? Um, I think one that's on my mind. Um, is that, you know, we have tested this for some sites in Canada for these crop types that I've mentioned. Um, the robustness of this method needs to be tested um, both within Canada over um, more growing seasons. 
and hopefully by the international community as well. Um, and I'm sure that as others uh, sort of take a look at this approach, um, I'm sure that the international community and all the researchers on the, the webinar today will will come up with um, you know even even better uh, algorithms to do this correlation. So I can imagine that you know as we build this out that we will get um, you know even better results that are ap applicable to to different cropping systems and it is robust over different growing seasons as well. So this is why this is not operational at this point because um, you know it is a research project and has been tested over this uh, you know this this limited geography in in Canada. So I'm sure there are other limitations as well, but that's one that that certainly comes to mind for me. Okay, great question. Thirty two. Is there any open source alternative available to MATLAB? to do the SAR calibrated NDVI to canopy structure dynamic model part of this exercise? Um, the short answer to this would be yes. Um, the crop structure dynamics model equation could be implemented in Python if needed. Um, in this case, it was already um, it was already programmed in MATLAB, so that's what we chose to use. But the equation could be um, implemented in any programming environment if needed. And question 33, are the SAR NDVI calibration coefficients published somewhere? Uh, no, we, we don't have those published. You can reach out to us if you're interested. You know, having said that, getting back to the question I just previously answered, you know, these coefficients are very specific for our uh, test sites. Um, it may be that those coefficients are robust when applied elsewhere, um, but I think that would require testing. So even if we give you the calibration coefficients, I would really encourage you to do a fulsome testing uh, of the, the workflow and the process for your particular, um, your particular site and test whether these calibration coefficients hold up over space and time. Thanks, Heather. Question 34. What's the optimal number of SAR data points needed to get accurate canopy structure dynamic model predictions of the temporal NDVI? Uh, so I'll take a, a stab at this. Um, the word optimal is a bit difficult to answer, I think, and, and I am guessing that this will be a little bit different depending on your particular cropping system and the, the crops that you're dealing with. Um, I can speak specifically for uh, the research that we presented here. We used uh, 500 segments. Um, so those are not necessarily 500 fields, but those are those 500 segments um, or objects um, covering uh, many different um, uh, many different fields, but also parts within fields. So I'm not suggesting that this is the optimal number, um, but this is the number of segments that we used. I think what's important in developing uh, these calibration equations is that you need to make sure that the data that you are using to do the calibration, that it's covering the entire uh, growing season so that you're capturing, uh, you know, from the beginning to the end of the season, you're capturing that, that full dynamic change in, in crop structure and crop development. So that will also be in, important, not just the, the number of segments, but that it's covering um, you know, the full uh, dynamic range of, of crop condition. Okay, question 35. The fit SAR calibrated NDVI to crop structural dynamic model step in the processing methodology, is it possible to apply it in other software? Uh, example, Python or R. Why do you use MATLAB? Uh, so I, I think we are, we're suggesting that this was probably answered, Sean, uh, previously in question 32. Yeah, I put that answer in there. I just, um, yeah. So question 36, are the weekly CCAP products available for download or as a consumable uh, REST service? Okay, uh, apologies, I don't know what, what REST service means, so um, that shows my limitation. Um, having said that, the CCAP products um, are downloadable, um, and I think uh, in the webinar, 
uh, I provided the um, the URL in order for you to uh, to take a look at the CCAT products and and download them as you like. So those are free and open. Okay, question thirty seven. Having the SAR NDVI, can we replace the backscatter with NDVI for these crops uh, and use for any other health assessment? So um, I can't say definitively yes or no to this, um, to, to answer this question, but I will give some, some thoughts here. Um, one of the challenges uh, with backscatter is that um, you know, backscatter is very sensitive to things like incidence angle, for example, um, calibration as well. Uh, not that SAR in general doesn't have to be well calibrated, um, but, um, you know, looking strictly at backscatter, there's a lot of things that can affect backscatter. You know, um, like I said, incidence angle, um, the background soil moisture, um, if there's, you know, do on the crop in the early morning. So there's a lot of things that affect backscatter. So that's why these polymetric parameters are really interesting um, because in some respects they, uh, you know, they, they mitigate some of these, um, uh, some of this noise or some of these um, external factors that affect backscatter. The other, the other reason that we looked at a machine learning calibration um, our first attempt at this uh, was to look at a simple linear model between, you know, a backscatter or, or polymetric response in NDVI. Um, and that gets um, to the robustness of the method as well. It's, it's really helpful to be able to use multiple radar parameters because as the crops are developing, different parameters are going to respond um, and contribute to this, this calibration. So, not only is backscatter a bit, um, as I said, there are a lot of these background variables that impact backscatter, um, but also it's really important to use, you know, this multivariate machine learning um, because we can really leverage um, multiple radar responses um, in order to, uh, to calibrate and detect vegetation condition. Okay, thanks, Heather. Question 38. What would be more likely the scenario of satellite crop mapping with the help of artificial intelligence machine learning in five to 10 years time? What research focus should we dig into now to make sure the future of satellite crop mapping keeps on getting better? Oh, that's a pretty broad question. Um, I'll just reflect a, you know, a little bit on, on my experience. Um, and that is that uh, you know I've been I've been very impressed with uh, you know as I said earlier some of the uh, information on on crop type crop condition crop development phenology that we've been able to um, to derive from uh, radar uh, data and I think there are a few reasons for that uh, we now have access to either fully polymetric or this quasi polymetric data from um, from satellite sensors. Uh, we have access to multi-frequency radar as well, um, and we're getting access to really dense time series of data through satellites like Sentinel-1. So we have richness on the radar side of things, whether it's amount of data um, or the characteristics, the multi-frequency, multipolar metric. So this is really gonna propel um, agricultural monitoring uh, using radar because we have access to this really rich source of, of SAR data. Um, here the, uh, the person posing the question is also talking about AI and machine learning and you know our experience has been that you know these types of advanced models can perform exceedingly well. Um, I was quite surprised that we were able to for example detect or, or estimate the phenology of crops using, um, using radar data over multiple growing season and multiple study sites. Um, and this speaks to the, you know, the, uh, the power of AI and machine learning. Um, what's really required, and here's a pitch here a little bit for the international community, is to build these, these methodologies, these AI machine learning methodologies is gonna require coordination 
these methods only work when they are very well trained, which means you have to have richness in, in terms of the, the field data as well. Um, so the, the more data that you have covering the more covering, you know, more seasons, more growing, uh, more, uh, more study sites, the better the performance of these, um, these machine learning algorithms. And so as a community, if we can come together to, you know, to share some of that data and develop some of these models, I think we'll be pretty surprised at, um, you know, the, the, the performance and the outcome of using radar for agricultural monitoring. So it's an exciting time for anyone who is starting their, their career. Well, we have 15 minutes left. Um, I guess as we're waiting for a potential question to come in, I, I did want to uh, thank Dr. Heather McNairn, uh, her team, Emily Lindsay, Shen Peng Zhao. Uh, Heather, you have been so instrumental in I want to say probably five different RSET trainings over the years. You've been added so much from your experience with um, uh, Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada, and just how much you've been able to contribute to all these trainings. We so appreciate it, and and thank you so much, and and, and as well as Emily and Shin Peng as well for for contributing to this webinar series. As we're, I guess it looks like we have another question, so I'll let you answer that, and then I, I did want to have a question for you um, to, to end that webinar. But question 39 is in SAR NDVI model, the SAR data is in linear scale or in DB scale? Will there be any effect if we use them interchangeably? Um, I would caution using them interchangeably. I think I would stick with one or the other, um, and preference would be for the DB scale, um, just because, um, that's that's the way that we've tested it, but um, yeah, hopefully that answers that question. And I just wanted, as we start wrapping up the and concluding this three-part webinar series, I wanted to give uh, both or all three uh, guest presenters today, Dr. Heather McNairn, uh, Emily Lindsay, and, and Xin Feng Zhao, the opportunity, if you wanted, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but if you had any maybe closing thoughts or remarks for, uh, looks like we have, at one time we had over 500 uh, attendees in this session A, and uh, I just wanted to know if you had any maybe closing remarks for anybody that might still be on the webinar. Uh, sure, I could start and then uh, Emily and Jim Feng can, can add if they have anything. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending um, and just put a pitch in there. You know, uh, SAR is, is amazing. Um, as I said uh, several times, what we're able to do with radar today, I would never have expected we could do that, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Some of that is the advancement in radar technology, which is accelerating at an incredible rate. Um, and some of it is because of all of the brilliant researchers that we have around the world that are developing some really innovative methodologies. Um, so it's a really exciting time to be part of the SAR family. Um, we've tried to answer the, your questions as best we can. If you have any further questions or we didn't answer them satisfactorily, you know, you can reach out to, to myself uh, or the team to, to answer them um, uh, better for you. So that's all I have, Sean. Great. Thanks, Heather. Emily, did you have any closing thoughts or remarks? Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate um, what Heather said, which is um, I'm very impressed with the attendance of this session. Um, it's very exciting that over 500 people are interested in SAR for agricultural applications. Um, so I'm excited to be involved in this research. And uh, yeah, for sure, if anyone has any further questions or if they have, um, if they're going to test this um, with their own data and their own um, cropping system, et cetera, um, I'd be very interested in um, hearing how that goes for you and um, if and to collaborate if there's um, any interest in that. So thank you. Great. And Xin Feng, uh, if you had any thoughts or closing remarks, uh, please feel free to unmute. And if not, uh, I did want to thank once more uh, Heather, Emily, and Xin Feng 
Uh, thank you guys so much. You guys nailed it out of the park. You did such a, an amazing job with the presentation, uh, the demonstration, and, and as well as answering all of these terrific questions that we got from all the participants. I also want to echo both Emily and Heather by thanking everybody that joined, uh, not just for today, but for all three parts of this webinar series. A little bit of housekeeping. We will have this question and answer document uh, uh, cleaned up and uploaded to our training page, uh, hopefully by next Tuesday. So uh, if you wanted access to this, uh, we will provide that for you. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of editing to it and then make sure that gets uploaded. Again, there will be one homework assignment uh, that is now accessible from the training page that is due on April 25th. So you have two weeks to work on it. Uh, we do encourage you to start early. Uh, and also we want to encourage you, there will be a survey, a post-training survey that will be sent out uh, this week, you should be receiving that. And we really do value the feedback that you give to us, not just as the RSET team, but we also share it with all the guest presenters so that they can uh, get the feedback from, from all of you. So please, we do encourage you. Uh, it, it doesn't take more than 10 minutes and we, we greatly value all the feedback you get, you give to us goes directly into how we prepare and plan for all of our upcoming trainings. So please do take the time, the 10 minutes it takes to complete that survey. We do value it. Um, so as we wrap up, I just want to thank everybody again and do, uh, you know, join the RSET listserv. We hope that you'll see you again on future trainings and we wish you all a very safe and fun rest of the week. Thank you.